best-selling author and serial entrepreneur, it's Gary Marcus. <laughs> So I'm here to talk today about the urgency and challenges in regulating AI. I want to start with some good news, which is I think global AI policy is finally on the radar. Pretty much everybody here is talking about it, and pretty much everybody in the world is. And that's a huge change from not that long ago. I gave a TED talk on April 18th of this year where I talked about global AI governance, and I think people looked at me like I was, I don't know, kind of strange talking about it then. Um, I started by saying that there are lots of risks to society. I talked about wholesale disinformation and market manipulation and accidental misinformation and maybe voice faking scams and, and automated cybercrime. I talked about all of this stuff in my TED talk and there was a hush in the room, like people hadn't really thought about that. Now, everywhere I go, I think people have already thought about these risks. I think there's been an astonishing change just since April 18th. Anka Royale, who's sitting um, in the front, wrote a, an economist piece with me uh, that came out the same day. We said the world needs an international agency for AI, say two experts. And when The Economist ran this again, April 18th, I think people thought that was kind of a weird idea. Uh, now everybody's talking about whether it's the right formulation, which formulation. Um, things have really changed since April. Um, by the time I got to the Senate on May 16th, I stood next to Sam Altman, or sat next to Sam Altman, and just before we went on stage, he said, you know what, Gary, I think the idea that you're pushing of an international agency for AI is actually a good one. And I was surprised because Sam Altman and I have not always had the best relationship. And I said, well, don't just tell me, tell them, tell the senators. And he did, and that was astonishing. And I think that really changed the world when he said that. So that was just May 16th. By May 25th, I spoke at the UN, and I was pushing some of the same ideas, and they were already starting, I think, to be a little bit popular. Um, <coughs> Rishi Sunak talked about them um, around the same time. Now, all that's great that people are talking about international AI governance. There are lots of questions around what that might mean, but there are, <coughs> I think, some bad news, too. There's some gaps that we need to think about. The first one we'll call the governance gap, which is we all know we need AI governance, but we don't know exactly what it is that we need. There's actually very little consensus when we get down to the details. <coughs> and I've been going around talking to a lot of world governments in the last um, month or two, and everybody's thinking about this in a different way. And everybody is aware, <coughs> excuse me, the governments move very slowly. We, we all know that, um, and we know that AI itself, especially in its adoption, is moving very quickly. I would argue that the technology is not advancing as fast as some people think, that GPT-4 is not that different from GPT-3, is not that different from GPT-2, which we've had for several years. But certainly the fact that 100 million people are now using this is really radically new. So we have this situation where governments move slowly, the technology is moving quickly, even if not at the scientific level, at the adoption level. So that's the first gap. The second gap I'll call the alignment <coughs> gap which is we know how to make AI that people want, but we don't know how to make AI that people can trust. And I'll just give you one simple example of this that kind of still blows my mind. You read about GPT-4, and people think that GPT-4 is this amazing technology that is on the verge of artificial general intelligence. The reality is it's not. Um, <coughs> it's fantastic at writing boilerplate text. It's really good at helping coders. I might have some disagreements about the medical study we just saw. But the reality is it's not as good at just learning everyday basic things as you think it is. To take the rules of chess, or take a game of chess, GPT-4 has probably been exposed to millions of games of chess because they're all there for the taking on the internet and we know GPT-4 has taken most of what's on the internet. Um, and the rules of chess are actually explicit. So Wikipedia, <coughs> is free and available and surely in the training set. So you would think if this system were like an artificial general intelligence, it would learn to play chess. 
And if you played it for 10 moves, you'd be like, wow, this thing does play chess. It knows all the moves in the Rui Lopez opening or whatever your favorite opening is, Sicilian defense. And then you get to like move 15 or 16 and it would start doing really weird things. Um, like having bishops jump over queens, which you can't do in actual chess, um, <coughs> but which ChatGPT4 or, or, uh, has been known to do. So we don't actually know how to get the systems even to, uh, a larger glass of water, thank you. We don't know how to force the systems to follow the rules that we want to follow. And if we can't get them to play chess, how can we be sure that they will follow other rules, like be honest or be harmless, don't cause harm to humans? So that's the alignment gap. <coughs> it's important to remember that large language models are not conventional software. We're mostly thinking about them the way we think about conventional software. But the reality is they hallucinate. They suffer from data leaks. They're basically incorrigible. You can't say, don't make stuff up. You know, <coughs> if somebody had a classical database as a, a competitor to SQL or something like that, and it hallucinated 20% of the time, they'd be laughed off the market. Here we have a system that makes errors 20% of the time. People think that's kind of acceptable because of some other virtues. But from a software design perspective, <coughs> it's crazy. Then we have a values gap, which is we know what we want. The UNESCO guidelines, for example, are terrific at articulating what we want. We want transparency, we want privacy, we want accountability, fairness. The White House bl blueprint um, bill of AI Bill of Rights it, it similarly calls for this. Even the big tech companies give lip service to these things like transparency. But <coughs> we have to remember, and I have a quote from Satya Nadella saying, we're taking a comprehensive approach to ensure we always build, deploy, and use AI in a safe, secure, and transparent way. But we're not. So GPT-4 is something that Microsoft owns part of and uses, right? And it's not transparent at all. We don't know what's in GPT-4. We know there's a large language model there. We know there's this thing called <coughs> RLHF, but we don't really know how it works. And we suspect there are other things in there, maybe even classical AI rules, but we don't know. <coughs> and we don't know, most importantly, what's in the data. And we know that these systems are incredibly sensitive to their data and that what biases, political biases, Hi hiring biases, all kinds of stuff they will do is a function of what data is in there. So Microsoft tells you they believe in transparency, but they're not actually following transparency. So we don't yet have a way to hold the co companies accountable to these principles that we all agree on. I see two futures here. One is a positive future. You know, maybe we form a global AI agency we start thoughtfully regulating AI. Maybe the idea of responsible AI becomes a prestigious profession rather than something a small number of people talk about. Maybe new companies and new technologies emerge. We can't just use large language models because we can't trust them. We actually need new kinds of AI, which is something nobody's really talking about right now. Everybody's assuming that the street light we've got right now is the one that we need. <coughs> I don't think that's true. Maybe we get to more efficient AI, both in terms of data and the amount of energy we use. <coughs> and maybe AI eventually um, is able to massively contribute to the world, addressing climate change, medicine, elder care, and many more. But there's also a bleaker future. So we could come into a world where conflicts over which risk we should even address in the field of AI preclude anything from happening. So we have right now, for example, AI safety community and AI ethics community arguing with each other. My problem is more important than your problem. Stop talking about your problem. Mine is the only one that matters. My short-term one is what matters. My long-term one is what matters. I'm afraid Congress in the US, for example, is gonna give up and discuss. Be like, if you guys can't agree on what the problem is, why should we bother? We'll go back to some other problem. <coughs> we might get stuck on large language models and never invent more efficient technology, more reliable technology. We might have a small number of companies that are more powerful than states running the world as they please. Shutting out all competition with ill-conceived regulation of their own devising, right? That's what we call regulatory capture. 
cyber crimes and big companies might wind up in some epic battle like drug cartel wars. I mean, wars, who knows? Um, increasingly powerful AI systems might be constructed, but if this is a dress rehearsal right now, you know, maybe they're going to become more and more weaponized. Large numbers of people are going to get killed in deadly conflicts. It could be accidental on purpose. Employment could crash. There could be widespread unrest. There could be civil wars. There could be anarchy. These are really very different futures. I'm not saying which one's coming, um, but I'm saying we need to figure out what we're doing. So here are five suggestions about AI policy. Uh, first is I think every country needs to have its own agency. There is so much going on so quickly and so much expertise required that I don't think we can assume that every country is going to just get by on its existing agencies. I think we need special purpose AI agency in every country. We probably should also have an international agency um, for AI. Maybe it's voluntary. Right now, eventually, we might need actual enforcement um, and requirements. We're going to need to look at a lot of different models. There's a lot of discussion nowadays about the International Atomic um, Energy Agency versus the IPC and the ICAO model and so forth. I think the main thing to understand there is no one model is going to suffice because there's actually many different things we're trying to address ranging from what happens if AI gets super powerful, which it isn't right now, but could, to what do we do about, for example, misinformation in elections. Each of these are going to require different aspects of, of solutions, so probably nothing off the shelf is going to work. The most important thing, though, I think, is agility is key. We need systems, the, uh, government <coughs> systems that can move quickly. I think we need something like an FDA pre-approval process for widespread deployment. It's okay to do research on new forms of AI, but if you're going to release something to 100 million people, probably you should do a hazard analysis and say, what are the benefits, what are the risks? Do the benefits actually outweigh the risk as we put this out for society? We're also going to need post-deployment auditing with government backing, where companies <coughs> excuse me, put things out, the government say, hmm, here's a question. Are people using GPT-4 to decide whether or not other people should get jobs? And it turns out the answer I hear is yes. And there's almost certainly bias in that. The government should be able to say, we want to know how much this is happening, how much bias is there. So we need post-deployment auditing. <coughs> Most importantly, we need scientists involved. I've been seeing a lot of press, um, like photo opportunities where governments bring in the leaders of the big companies. The big companies have been going on these tours and the governments host them. That's actually sending the wrong signal. The signal that's sending is regulatory capture, that the companies, the big companies, are going to tell us what the rules are. Well, obviously, they're going to make them in their own interest if they do that. So we need scientists um, and, and ethicists and so forth, people from civil society at the table. Another thing that I have been thinking about is how philanthropy can help. So uh, we, with Anka, who is sitting here in the front row, we, we've been proposing a model something like this. Um, a CERN-like international agency, we could talk about what we mean by CERN-like, um, but catalyzed by philanthropy focused on mitigating AI risks. And we see this as having three tracks. One of those tracks is about basic research and applied research. Um, basic research, how do we build new approaches to AI that are trustworthy? And applied research, given the risks that we have now, what do we do about them? So for example, misinformation is a risk right now. Can we build new tools to detect misinformation? The second thing is about world-class expertise. Having advice, scientists <coughs> willing to step in for the governments around the world who don't have their own expertise. The third is something that we're calling regulation in a box or governance in a box. And the idea is to make it as easy as possible for the governments around the world to do what they need to do. Give them metrics, standards, tools that are easy to use, and give them away free or close to free. <coughs> so I am pleased to announce today that we are launching the Center for the Advancement of Trustworthy AI. We've gotten our first funding from the MIDIAR network um, to help us get this started. Today is the first time I'm saying this publicly to the world right now. Um, and is built on the model. Thank you very much. And I should add that um, some members of, of the UN, um, UNESCO, have been very warm to this idea. We may have further announcements um, about that at some point. Um, so I'm pleased to announce this, and I, I will end a little bit early. <coughs> Possibly there's time for questions, I don't know. Um, but here's how I will end. The choices that we make now are going to shape the next century. 
If we don't have scientists and ethicists at the table, I don't think our prospects are great. If we just leave this to the big companies telling the governments what to do. We can't afford to not regulate AI, and we can't afford regulatory capture where the companies decide. We have to get this one right, and we don't have a lot of time to waste. And I thank you very much. Thank you.